she sat down Indian style on the floor in her room in front of her pink and white mansion of a dollhouse. And like most kids, she even kept the inside of the dollhouse cleaner than her own room. Because she didn't want Ken complaining when he got home from work that the house wasn't clean and that his dinner wasn't ready. Because in her mind, he would always say, great job, I love you, honey, every time he would walk through the doors of their house. She always wanted a family. And as she got older, even though she outgrew the dollhouse, the dollhouse never outgrew her. Every time a man would smile at her, for example, it would create this architectural design in her mind of their wedding day. The harmony in his smile would sound like the harmony that would ricochet through the butterflies of her stomach when she imagined herself walking down the aisle to his broad shoulders, his tailor-made tux, his glorious smile and eyes that said, I do, before she even made it to the front of the church. She hadn't been waiting on this moment for a while. In fact, the majority of her life, she had been mentally preparing herself not only to be a wife, but also a mom. So when the doctor told you that you were unable to have kids, I imagine that it felt like God had tied the tubes of your dreams. Because you were no longer able to give birth to your fantasies, your dollhouse probably felt stampeded by God's sovereignty. And you began to ask yourself, will Ken ever want to come home to a Barbie who can no longer birth his desires out of her plastic? And how long will it take before Ken is no longer attracted to my package? Am I good enough? Will he still want me if I can't give him a kid? If Abraham was satisfied with Hagar, then will Ken be more satisfied with Midge? She began to question God's goodness like an equation. She thought doing A plus B would equal C, the manifestation of the desires of her heart. If she D lighted in him, that she would see a sunny. So it made absolutely no sense that if God said be fruitful and multiply, why she would never see a harvest manifesting in her tummy. Did you know that she feels uncomfortable every time you talk about kids around her? Every time she even sees a Hagar, there's always this elephant in the room of a heart like Babar. And she becomes overtaken with jealousy and will even look to God and ask questions like, are you telling me that you would rather let this whole Gomer have a whole say it, but you can't even give me a child that I've been praying for? That's just low. I mean, that's just real low, Ruhama, that you think a prostitute would be better suited to be a mama than me. Sarah, I know the doctors told you that you would be unable to have kids, but I also know that going to medical school for 12 years does not make them God. It just makes them probability prophets, who are probably prophets of the probability instead of the possibility of what's God sent. And if you having a baby seems impossible, just remember you can't spell impossible without I'm possible. And I'm is short for I am. And I am is the great I am. So if the great I am is in the I am possible, nothing is impossible in spite of what is logical, Sarah. There is a reason why your name originally ended with the letter I, because God wanted to remind you that Sarai cannot do it alone. And that's why God changed your name to Sarah from Sarai, so that you can always remember the H comes before the I, him before the I, because when God gives you a new name, he creates a new purpose. So just because the doctors told you that you were unable to bear fruit does not mean that your womanhood is worthless. Sarah, your womb is not a wasteland. Your womb is a garden that the Lord is going to water when he pardons your diagnosis. What if in God's eyes, your faith was the only thing that had endometriosis? Or PCOS, Sarah, God is not making your husband shoot blanks. He's just playing Russian roulette with his glory. He has a bullet in the chamber waiting to fire a testimony that's going to give birth to the happiest day of your life. Sarah, don't have faith in him just because you want to have children. Have faith that he could do anything because he is God. And if, 
And if it was placed on your heart, then by all means pursue adoption. But don't just do it because you low-key have lost faith in your options. Just because some Dr. Kevorkians tried to speak death to your fallopian, one day you will be feeding your child Similac. So, Lord, I'm asking that you open the faithful wombs of the children that are yours and close up the wombs of them that are not like Abimelech. Stop settling for Ishmael's when he promises an Isaac like Ezekiel said it almost saved. Your lack of faith is what's making you an almost slave. Sarah was like 90. You're not even 30. <laughs> or barely 30. There is a way, Sarah. Go ahead and continue to play with your dollhouse. Let your imagination fill the vacant rooms with baby toys and Elmos. Forget where you put the baby pacifier. Inadvertently step on Velcro shoes. Clean the house for your husband because even if he never walked through those doors, your husband already did when he died on the cross. Sarah. Go ahead and continue to play in your dollhouse because one day it will be your home. You call it an ovary. God calls it an over-easy situation that he could fix if you would just believe me. Sarah, one day you will have children. And if I'm never there to see that day, then in advance, welcome to motherhood.